Thanks for coming along, everyone. Um, my name is Shane Lynn. Um, I am CEO and co-founder of a company called Edgetier. Uh, we're a relatively small startup in, in Dublin, and we work a lot in the area of text processing and natural language processing uh, applied to customer service. Um, so I wrote the title for this talk maybe maybe three or four months ago, and when I went to make the slides, I quickly, very quickly realized that uh, there's there's a lot of content here. So this is going to be, the, the aim of this talk is a fairly whirlwind tour of word vectors, what they are and why you should be using them, um, and an intro then to recurrent neural networks, how you would implement them in Python and why you would do that. Um, the aim of my talk here today is to kind of, I suppose, give people a bit of background and so that you go home to your own projects and you have ideas for using these type of techniques and you know where to start. So for those starting out or who might not be familiar completely with data science terminology, uh, this talk is about text classification. So text classification is essentially the automatic sorting of text into categories. Um, classification is a supervised technique, so we start with labeled data and essentially we're building machines to automatically categorize text into relevant labels. So examples might include categorizing web pages, automatically categorizing uh, segments from books, uh, articles, it's used in spam filtering, so whether in classifying emails as spam or not spam, and things like sentiment analysis. If I was giving this talk, say, a year ago or two years ago, the approach that I would have talked about would have entailed something like this. So I, I would have taken a set of text I would have counted all the words in that text to create what's called a bag of words. Um, I would have created a large matrix where, if you imagine, each column in the matrix is a word and each row is a document. And I would have filled in the number of times each word appeared in the document in this big matrix. And then I would have applied standard classification techniques to build a model on that. So things like naive Bayes models, SVMs, random forests, or XGBoost. And that, that technology still works and works really, really well. It's hardened, it's fast, it's easy to train. There's a load of really good libraries out there to do that. So if you're building that kind of model, um, there's blogs online to do that. And the types of libraries you'll use are NLTK, you'll see blogs on pandas for data processing, and you'll see blogs on using scikit-learn to do the classification. There's a few other steps you might include. And what we found in our work is those models get us to 90% accuracy. They're, they're really good and you can train them. You can probably build a model to do that in a couple of hours uh, and it'll be not that memory intensive and work quite fast. What we've come to see though is that you do lose some accuracy for the intricacies of human communication. So if you're dealing with freely written human text, things get a little bit difficult. Um, you lose context, which is a big thing. So the context in which words appear is really, really important. These type of models are sensitive to misspellings, so people spelling stuff wrong, just if you spell something slightly off, it won't appear in the same place in your matrix, and one document will look different to the other, even though the meaning is the same, and it's insensitive to order. And ultimately this comes down to the fact that computers work really well with, you know, mathematically concrete, definite rules, things you can work out, but language is ambiguous, and the way that we communicate with each other entails a lot more than just rules around which words appear. So I can show real headlines or sentences like this to an audience like you. You can parse these sentences and based on the context of the words and where they appear, you know that the Pope isn't stepping on gay people. You know that a court isn't going to shoot a defendant because you can put the context of those words together and I'm going with that. If we're counting words using a computer, we lose that context. Similarly, if we're counting words to classify customer intent or classify what people want to say, the same words are in these two sentences, but they actually have opposite meanings. So the order of the words is also of key importance. So the old models where I count the number of words, put them into a matrix, both of these sentences will appear in the same place. So in today's talk, where we're going to talk about a slightly different approach from using a bag of words, we're going to talk about using what are called word vectors and we're going to talk about uh, classifying those word vectors using neural networks. Now, there was an excellent talk yesterday on word vectors uh, by Marco, who's down the back. I don't know if anyone attended that, but it was a really good overview of word vectors. And unfortunately, he seemed to preemptively steal a lot of my slides, so there might be some like uh, <laughs> repetition here. 
Um, his was a good bit better, unfortunately. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about neural networks. So there's two parts to this presentation I'm going to go through. So I'm going to start off with word vectors, talk about what they are, why you should use them, and then I'm going to talk about neural networks, what they are, why you should use them, and then I'm going to go through a very quick example. So a little bit of whirlwind. Uh, if I see very confused faces in front of me, I'll try and explain better, but feel free to ask questions as we go. So we're going to start with word vectors. So word vectors are n-dimensional vectors that represent words. So all that means is an n-dimensional vector is just a list of numbers, and we essentially have a list of numbers for every word that exists, or we should have. Um, each word has a, has a vector, and that n-dimensional vector can be of any dimension, but typically the models that you see out there are either 50 or 300 in terms of words. So for a single word, like the word Python, there would be 300 numbers that are associated with the word. And those numbers are designed such that they encapsulate the meaning of the word or the context of the word. Similar words will have similar vectors. And I mean similar from a numeric sense. So if I calculate the distance between the two vectors, they'll be quite similar. And the, the, the idea of word vectors isn't new. So these first appeared um, in documentation like in 1957 with academic papers. Uh, and the idea here was that a word is characterized by the company it keeps. So you can characterize the meaning of a word by the context at, at which it appears. So if I was to take, say, the entire Wikipedia corpus, so billions and billions of words, and put them into a big document, and take an example here, take the center word vehicle, and every time the word vehicle appears in Wikipedia, look at the words that appear to the left and to the right. Each mention of the word vehicle will have similar context words. So the words that we see around the word vehicle in Wikipedia are probably things like road, engine, drive, drove, steering, model, seat. And then I could say the same thing for words that are similar to vehicle. So if I swap vehicle out, or sorry, if I look further away, the words that won't appear around vehicle are things like moon and dinosaur and London and office. These are words that will be out of context. And I can swap words in for vehicle. So for instance, the word car is probably quite close to vehicle, and I would expect that to have similar context words in the Wikipedia corpus. The same for van, but if I took a completely different word and focused, say, on the word moon, I would then expect the context words to be very, very different, okay? And the outer context words similarly. And that's basically the essence of how you create word vectors. What happens is, and you can brush over this a little bit, but on the left, we form a huge vector where there's zeros for every word that we know of and a one in the word that we're trying to use as the center word. So say there's a one at the point in the vector for vehicle. We pass that through a model, so let's not worry about the, the, the constant of the, model, the, the, the topic of the model, but on the far side, on the output, we try to predict and put ones in the places where the context words are quite likely. So on the left, we have a one where there's a vehicle, and on the right, we have ones or high numbers, the probabilities. On the right, we have ones where there's context words, so things like drove, car, uh, tire, those kind of things. And the same thing, if you imagine, in the middle, there's what's called a hidden layer, and that has 50 or 300, and that's what forms the word vector. So if you imagine the input vector for a vehicle has a one at the vehicle space, the input vector for car has a one in a completely different place in the input, but yet the outputs are the same. And what ends up happening is that the center neurons of the model essentially look the same for both vehicle and car, and that's what forms the word vectors. Now that's a little bit complex, but that's basically how they're made. And that's called a skipgram architecture. There's a few other ways of working them out. One is called the continuous bag of words, and these form different ways to create word vectors. But once you've created a word vector, then you have these really valuable numbers to explain things. So on the right there is a picture that, um, of what maybe a three-dimensional word vector space would look like. And you can see that similar words end up in similar places. So the words for Dublin, Shannon, London, Ireland, or Bristol all end up in a similar clump as places. Words, verbs like travel, drove, and drive end up in a different place. And then car models, Ford, Focus, CMAX 
end up in a different place in this vector space. Now that's a three dimensional space. And what you need to imagine with word vectors is a 50 dimensional space or even a 300 dimensional space. And there's a great power in these word vectors. Um, and they're, they've, they've, what's happened is they're now being used for natural language processing because you're inserting contextual knowledge into your models kind of for free. You don't need to train on the Wikipedia um, corpus. It's already been done for you. And you can capture how words relate to each other in your models. If you're doing this in Python, it, it's actually quite simple. So the standard approach or the easiest way to get started is to download a pre-trained model. So you can head on to Google, do a search for word vectors, and Google will provide for you pre-trained models that have been trained with lots of computational power on, say, the entire Wikipedia corpus, the entire Google News corpus, massive data sets with billions and billions of words that echo how things uh, are reflected in normal language use. Marco made some great points yesterday around being careful with this, in that there's, there's inherent biases in the way that we use language that will also be reflected in the model. So you need to be a little bit careful. But it's quite simple to use. So in Python, there's a, there's a great library called GenSim, which makes all of this very accessible. Essentially, you load the vectors from a binary file, and that's it, you're away. So for each word, you can access the vector on the bottom left there, similar to the way that you'd access um, anything in a dictionary. You just pass in the word, and out pops a vector. As you can see, I'm accessing the, the vector for simple there on the left. And you can also do operations such as finding the most similar vectors to words. So on the right, I'm working out what's the most similar words that are in the Google News uh, word vector space for Python. And the way it works out most similar is it goes to that space in the 300 dimensional space and just looks at what other vectors are around there, either by proximity or by angle, so cosine distance. And you can see that other languages, other programming languages come out, and even more so, other Python-based programming languages are even more similar. If you go down the road of using this in production, you're nearly always better and will get better accuracy from your models if you train your word vectors on corpus that come out of your own data. So in this case, we're actually working a little bit here with a travel company, and you can see that we've trained this on travel bookings. So on the top left, I'm getting the most similar words to the word Mondeo. They deal a lot with cars. Um, and you can see that the most similar words are actually other Ford models of cars. And the power of this model is that it's also, it captures misspellings, because misspellings will fit in sentences the same way as the correctly spelled words and abbreviations. So things like THX for thanks, things like misspelled place names, they'll all fall into the same place. Another useful thing around here, and it's useful, well, it's useful for fun as well as it's, um, it kind of shows the power of these things. But the word vectors also encapsulate the relationships between words. So, for instance, all the words for, may, for say, man and the transition from man to woman will be the same as the transition from king to queen. So it's like a male-female relationship inside this multidimensional space. The same way as you'll find relationships for past tense, present tense, walking, walked, drove, drive, swimming, swam, and also then relationships for things that would, you wouldn't expect, things like city names, countries, currencies, rivers. The word vectors build in such a way, almost automatically, that the way that we use words encapsulates capital of, the, the, the idea of this is the capital of this, or this is the biggest river in this. Uh, and you can use Jensen then to access word vectors that way. So for instance, here's an example. I loaded the, uh, I did these last night. I loaded the Google News documents. And if I look at similar by vector, the vector for Obama minus the vector for USA plus the vector for France, I end up at Sarkozy. Uh, now it doesn't always work. I had to try a few examples to get one that looks cool on a slide, but it works some of the time. Uh, and same way for Dublin minus Ireland plus, plus France, I ended up at Paris. And these work even on, we've trained some of these in, in real customer data on much, much less than, you know, the Wikipedia corpus on, you know, a couple of hundred thousand kind of queries from customers. And it still captures these kind of meaningful relationships. So for word vectors, I would say, um, I would say just crack into them. If you're doing anything in natural language processing and you're doing anything in text classification and you haven't used word vectors, it's, it's definitely worth giving it a shot. You have two options. One is, or you have more, probably more than two, but I'd recommend two. The Jensen Library and the Spacey Library. Um, if you're doing anything in NLP, the Spacey Library is very useful. 
GenSim will allow you to download models from online and load those models directly into Python and then very quickly get your word vectors for any words in your corpus. And you can then build classification models based on sentences by just averaging the word vector across the sentence. Uh, and the same way with Spacey. Spacey actually comes with word vectors built in. So very, very simple in Python. You literally import the library. You tell it to load its English model. You pass in the text that you want to, uh, to process. And basically, it's all done for you at that point. So this Spacey kind of captures all of the stuff that people might do in NLTK or any other text processing. It splits the sentence into words. It identifies entities in, in the sentence. And it also applies word vectors to each word. So all you do is go word.vector, and you're away. Um, and even very, very, very quickly, you can start to see things that make sense. So here, I've encoded sentences with Spacey, and then I'm able to compare the similarity. And the similarity built into Spacey is based on word vector cosine distance. So you can see the first two sentences here are actually quite similar in meaning, and they end up with the highest similarity, whereas the second two sentences, sentence three and sentence four, when I look at the similarity between those two and sentence one, the results are lower. So my take on word vectors is that if, you if you're not playing with them already, definitely have a look. And we found that even in raw form like this, without even touching neural networks at all, just by getting the word vectors for, um, for your corpus and for the stuff that you're working with, you can feed those into normal models that you might already be using, and you'll see a, a bump in accuracy. Because you're kind of cheating. You're, you're, really, you're, you're bringing in word vectors, and those word vectors, essentially, you're bringing in context from all of the work that Google has done on Wikipedia or on Google News. And all of that contextual information from outside is now being brought into your model, where before you didn't have that. So that's part one. Um, we're kind of on time. Part two is on recurrent neural networks, and then I'll bring the two parts together. So neural networks, um, for those of you who don't or haven't used them, uh, you've probably heard about them in the news, shouted and lauded as artificial intelligence or as a new wave of machine cognition that's going to take over the world. Um, but I would argue that they're not. They are classification models that happen to work quite well. And there's been recent advances in both computing power and in the techniques used to train and build neural networks that have bumped up the accuracy and there's a bit of hype. Uh, we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks, which are neural networks that have memory. And the idea here is to, I'm going to build it up from scratch. So if you haven't come across a neural network before, a neural network is essentially quite complex, but the individual parts are very simple. So at its very, very basic, a neural network is made up of small computing units like this called neurons. Okay? So a neuron takes inputs from the left, called x in this diagram, it multiplies, each, and when I say inputs, there's numbers. So x1, say, is the number 2. It multiplies x by w, which is just a weight, not a number. It adds up all of those multiplications, and then it passes the result through what's called an activation function. So an activation function can take many shapes, but there's three there. So one is linear, one is um, a, a tan wave, and one is a sigmoid. And basically, the activation function just ensures that the output is between 0 and 1, or is between minus 1 and plus 1. So you don't get massive, massive numbers. And that's all a neuron does. So it's a very, very simple addition, multiplication, and a single function. On its own, it's essentially linear regression with a, an activation function at the end. But these things get more powerful when we start joining them together. So a neural network is where we take multiple neurons, and we line them up in layers. So here's a very simple three-layer neural network with an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. Each one of these dots essentially contains one of the neurons I just spoke about. Now, if I, very, if I sat here for a while okay, and sat and talked to you all and said, now I want you to set the numbers for the weights and for the activation functions such that the bottom output neuron outputs a 1 when the bottom input neuron outputs a 1. We could probably do it in like a few minutes. We could probably you know, fill in the ones, fill in the zeros, and just make sure that when the output, when the input number three is one, the output number two is one. And adjusting the weights and adjusting the activation functions that way, that's training the neural network. Now, that'd be a very manual way of doing it. And that might work for simple functions. But if I then gave you 
a more complex neural network with a few extra layers and a few extra neurons, that task quickly becomes untenable to be doing uh, manually. And if I said to you, okay, the input now is actually going to be the individual pixels for a picture of a cat, and I want the third output neuron to light up if there's a cat in the picture, we wouldn't get around to it in this, uh, in, in this lecture anyway. So the way this is done is you get loads of pictures of cats, you pass them into the neural network, and you adjust the weights over time so that the neurons turn on when there's cats. And that's called training. There's a whole heap of maths behind that, but essentially it's done with something called backpropagation and gradient descent. And those training techniques have really improved over the last few years. Now, the problem with this neural network for text is that the output is directly related to the input at a given point in time. Okay? And that's not how you process information. That's not how a lot of things process information. So as I speak to you in words, each word that I give you, the meaning you put on that word depends on the last two or three words that I've said. So in this case, this works really well for images. Here's a picture of a cat. Is there a cat in the image? One time. But in a video, if I was trying to keep track of things, I would want to see the previous three or four frames or even three or four seconds to tell what's happening in a scene. Okay? So scenes are contextual based on a temporal, um, a temporal dimension. So neural networks like this, they kind of start thinking, um, start thinking from scratch every second. And that's where the idea of a recurrent neural network came from. So a recurrent neural network takes the outputs from one layer and essentially feeds them back in. So it gets a bit more complex and gets a bit more messy. It becomes harder to train. The training algorithms take quite long and um, it's just a bit, yeah, horrible. But there's loads of different ways to build these. Um, and, but the problem is the training is difficult. They came out in the 1980s and they did see gains. So there was gains in things like text classification and things like language understanding. And nothing really happened for a long time. And I suppose there's been recent developments. And the most recent, or one of the most recent, is what's called a long short-term memory uh, neuron. So an LSTM. So I've built up now from simple neuron to feed forward, from feed forward to recurrent. And now this is like a different type of neuron that's now used in neural networks. And these neurons don't just depend on the input, but they have an internal hidden state. And that state can be updated it can be forgotten, it can be changed over time. But it means that a neuron can train on something over time and it can learn to recognize and remember something from an infinite number of time steps back. So if I train these types of models on text, you might find a neuron that remembers the name or the, the uh, let's say, the gender of the subject of the sentence. And you'll only see that neuron switch from one to zero when the next subject comes in and it might go from male to female. Without ever being told that's important. So this is what's amazing. So some really good um, examples of these online. So these LSTMs have kind of brought things on like a, another big step forward in accuracy. So not, this isn't like old stuff. This is between 2007 and 2011. Google uses these for speech translation, big gains in video, big gains in text and big gains in all sorts of time-based um, data processing. There's an unbelievable example online. Um, there's a guy, uh, Andres Karpathy. Uh, he's very, very good at this. Um, he was writing these blog posts during his PhD, and he's now director of AI for Tesla. So he's, uh, he's reasonably good at the old neural networks. <laughs> um, but he then, as kind of a part-time thing, he took these neural networks and he passed in the entire works of Shakespeare and he trained the neural network on individual characters on the neural networks and said, okay, here's the individual characters that are coming in in a sequence and here's the next character. And then he worked it backwards and said, now start with a random character and generate some Shakespearean text. And this is actually the output of a neural network. So you can see that amazingly, the network's kind of like to an uneducated boffin, I'd be looking at this saying, like, that's good Shakespearean text there. Uh, but it remembered, you know, it put in character names, it capitalized some of the character names, it followed the format of the text, it put in spaces between the different packages or the different paragraphs. Um, it has a semicolon after the character name. And the sentences kind of make sense. So it learned all of this 
just completely automatically from previous previous samples. Then you do the same thing, but this time with the code base from the entire Linux op operating system. And the neural networks generated source code. Now the source code didn't compile or do anything, but it looks exactly like source code. So the system, you know, put in defined statements. It defined functions and opened them and closed them. It had semicolons at the end of each line. It had proper use of brackets, indentation. And when he looked at the individual neurons, he spotted neurons that kept track of, am I in a function? How deep am I for indentation? Am I at the start of a file and should I put in the copyright notice? There's LSTM neurons that turned on and turned off as they went through the text. So open bracket, this one turns on, close bracket, that one turns off. And it learned all of those things just through the training procedure. So they're quite powerful. And I'd really recommend uh, reading that blog post. It's called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks, if you're interested in this space. So the way we access this stuff then in, um, in Python, uh, it, it's quite simple. There's two libraries that we're going to look at today. So Keras and TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow is the open source machine learning library from Google for training neural networks. And Keras is kind of a high level API that uh, allows us to interact with TensorFlow without getting into the nitty gritty. Um, combining these two things together, you can see how the word vectors are gonna inject information from outside of your training set. And also then the LSTMs are gonna allow us to build text-based models that both have memory and take into account the, uh, the, the vectors. So I've built up a little toy example um, that that was a bit, it's just something simple. So um, I took data from the 20 news groups data set, which is uh, 20,000 samples of text from news groups that used to exist. Uh, they're basically posts, it's basically an old uh, post kind of system. And I've reduced it down to just contain two topics. So I looked at two topics, politics and religion. I took the samples from news groups relating to those and I labeled them zero and one. So I just have a simple data set with 6,000 samples. It's about, it's split 50, 50, 3,000 each. Uh, you can see there are samples. So essentially I have put these in a pandas data frame. I've labeled them zero and one, and you can see the text there is free form text, a bit messy, but uh, you can kind of tell which ones are politics and which ones are religion. Um, I removed punctuation for this, for this example. So we're gonna build a neural network that has three layers. So remember the layers I was showing you on, three layers that you'll see quite often in the neural network literature starts with an embedding layer. And the embedding layer's job is to essentially turn the text from strings of text into strings of word vectors, okay? So we're going to the word vectors first. And I'm gonna preload the embedding layer with the word vectors from the Google model that we spoke about earlier on, okay? The, so what'll go in there is a sequence of numbers, one number per word. What comes out is a matrix of word vectors. So one word vector per word. This feeds into the LSTM layer, which is the long short-term memory modules that we talked about earlier on. Uh, and you can kind of choose however many of these you want. So I put in, I think, 150 in this model. And they'll work through the, the sequence of, of word vectors coming through. And then finally, a dense layer at the end. A dense layer is just a fully connected layer, like a feed-forward network that we saw, where each LSTM is connected to one neuron, and my layer only has one neuron in it. So there's one neuron with 150 connections from the LSTMs and only one output. So my output here is just either a zero or one, okay? So embedding, LSTM, dense, with one output, politics or religion. So this is just kind of a toy example. So there's a few steps. So um, the first thing we need to do is, and I can post these so you can get the code, but first thing we need to do is we need to change our texts from words into numbers. So we take all the texts we have, we find all of the unique tokens, all the unique words, we give each one of those tokens a number, and then we convert all of the text from sentences into, into arrays of numbers. So for example, the sentence, I play Rocket League, might get changed into you know, the numbers 44, 56, 2003, 1980, whatever. Each one of those numbers relates to a word in our large corpus where we counted all of the words that exist in this data set, okay? Uh, the second thing we do is we then pad those. So we change all of the input documents to have the same length. Um, that helps with training and makes it all a bit faster. Essentially, we zero pad them on the left. So if something shorter than, I think for this example, I use 200 characters. If there's a news group shorter than 200 characters, we add 
whatever it needs, 100 zeros at the start. And if it's longer than 200 characters, in this example, I actually just trim it to 200. Yeah, so the shape of the input here now is gonna be our 6,000 samples on the bottom left, our 6,000 samples of so 5997 and 200 long, okay? So each word being a number. Does that make sense? A few nods. So, as I said, the first thing we're gonna do is load in the vectors from Google into our embedding matrix. So all I do here is I go through every word I've discovered. I go into the, the model that I downloaded from Google. I say, give me the vector, and I just put it into a matrix. So that's all I'm doing. So the matrix starts with all zeros, and obviously it'll be, uh, I think, sorry, I discovered 55,000, bottom left there, I discovered 55,777 words in this corpus. So my embedding layer here will be 55,777 wide and 300 word vector numbers for each word. And all I'm doing is pre-filling that. So that's all that loop does there. So I essentially end up with an embedding matrix that's 55778 by 300. And then you build a neural network. So Keras has made this quite simple. You basically create a sequential network in the top and then you add layers one by one. So you can see here, back to the diagram, I add an embedding layer first. After the embedding layer, I add an LSTM layer, and after the LSTM layer, I add a dense layer. So it's, it's quite simple. Um, it's reasonably simple to do, actually. So all of the, you can see there, I put in the weights as the embedding matrix, and I've wrote trainable equals false, which means during the training procedure, I won't change that matrix. Now, the problem here for me in this stuff is that there's just so many options, and that's just a bit daunting. So, you know, I pick 100 LSTM neurons here, kind of just pick that, you know, I said like, oh, how many will I put in here? 100 sounds like a nice number, but that could be 150, 200, 300, 400, 50, 10, and the model will work, but your accuracy will be different. And each time you train it, it starts from a randomized, it starts from um, a, a randomized point. So each time you train it, the results will be slightly different. And that's the one problem I find with working with these neural networks. It's very hard to, hard to optimize to to the perfect model. You just get it to good enough by trying a few times. Uh, there's also one extra layer there that I didn't mention earlier called a dropout layer. And a dropout layer essentially reduces overfitting by randomly setting certain values to zero. Um, so all you're gonna do then is you look at a quick model summary. So that's our four layers. And you can see there that there's 160,000 trainable parameters in this model. So there's 160,000 parameters that the training algorithm will go through as we present our figures. Uh, you do a compile step, which is the bottom left. That's just something Keras needs. And again, you can change all of these. So you can change both the optimizer function, um, you can change the loss function, and you can change the metrics that you're looking at. So there's quite a lot of, I find with this stuff, there's quite a lot of fiddling around to find out what works better. There's a lot of advice online about trying things out. You can add additional layers, you can add convolutional layers. But your best bet is to just start off and then start looking at uh, there's papers online, there's best practice neural network structures that work for certain problems. And if you look around, you'll find the ones that, that will work best for your problem. Um, and then you just press train. So once you start training, I did this on a, a, a MacBook. This MacBook is an i5 uh, and it was slow enough. It took about half an hour to train that network. So quite slow, but it reached kind of 91% accuracy after, after that 25, 30 minutes. Uh, that was like 225 seconds per layer. Again, you can fiddle with things like the batch size, um, the epochs, so the batch size is how many samples you take from your data set every time to update the weights, and the epochs is how many times you run through the entire data set. So in this case, I presented my data set of, um, I took training data of 80% to 20%, I think. Uh, I presented the 80% of the training data 10 times to the network and evaluated on what the accuracy was on the validation set then. Uh, the validation set was at the other 20 percent. Um, that's slow on a CPU. When we're doing this for customers or when we're working with real life applications, we might spin up a, a GPU based Amazon instance. You'll only pay three or four dollars an hour, but you'll see a 30 to 50 x improvement in speed. So this could have been trained in kind of a couple of minutes rather than a half an hour. Your fan gets loud as well, so you, you feel quite you feel quite cool training them because you know it feels like you're really training artificial intelligence or doing stuff. Sort of, it's like this takes half an hour. I need to go get a cup of tea. I'm really working hard. Um, and does it work? It, this one works. So I built this just last night to kind of show today. Um, 
leaving this last minute. And uh, it works. So the input needs to be changed into sequences, but once you pass it through, it works. So there's four test sentences. This achieved 91% uh, accuracy. And I actually ran it again after I'd made the slides with some slight changes. I let it, um, I increased the number of neurons in the LSTM layer, and I let it change the weights of the embeddings, and it got to 96%. But I didn't feel like I painted the slides. Uh, so you can see me passing in sentences here. I've passed in four sentences, and I've made them, you know, they're kind of clearly, one is religious and one is political, but you can see that the model works. It, it catches them in and out. Now, that's kind of a nice uh, test case, I suppose. I'll show kind of time we got, yeah. So in real use cases, um, we built a system recently called Arthur, um, and Arthur reads customer emails for customer service. So we're using this technology essentially to read emails as they come into clients. Uh, and we categorize those emails based on the topic that the customer is talking about and the intent of the customer. And this is the type of thing we do. So we use word vectors that we've trained on their previous emails. We use LSTM networks to do the classification. And once that job is done, we then have uh, a lot of logic to basically write the email back to the customer automatically. So it fully writes the email, and then it presents that to a customer service agent to give the go ahead. So we don't want, we don't fully trust the computer to understand what the text is. And I don't think we're a long way from that. So while these things are quite good, they're not 100%. You don't want to take that risk with customer service. And we're seeing kind of a 5x improvement in how much people can process using this system. But it's a real use case of these word vectors and LSTMs. Internally, we very much had a battle around using the old techniques. So using things like um, TF-IDF matrices and XGBoost. Um, and we got, that was good. It was like 90, 91% accurate. Um, and these things took a lot of work and a lot of time to get right. And we're messing around on Amazon trying to train things and we were reading a load about them. But the reality is that the accuracy jumped to 96, 97%. And in this system, we're going to process, you know, a million emails next year. And that 5% increase is a couple of thousand emails a month, which is a lot for someone to process. So for us, if you're dealing at volume, it's worth moving to these technologies or what, that's what we found because once you've done them, it works. <laughs> Um, whereas in a lot of use cases, that 5% mightn't be as um, impactful. So you need to take that into account. There is a, an additional technology burden once you take on this stuff. Um, in conclusion, though, I would say that these things have moved on massively and they've gotten way better. And there's also there's a lot of stuff out there for you to get started on your journey in this. It's much more accessible. There's a huge amount of blog posts and tutorials out there that'll get you going and you'll learn kind of by doing. Um, it's possible on a CPU, you don't need a GPU, um, but if you get bigger data sets, you'll definitely need a GPU. Um, and I've kind of brushed across a lot of theory there. I've kind of thrown in some stuff around layers. If you're going into it, be prepared to read a bit more gobbledygook around how all that works um, to make sure you understand fundamentally. But I'd say don't be daunted. But similar to the way we've attacked um, the agent assist approach, I think it's worth keeping in mind that the computer itself knows nothing about language or how humans interact. So while you may accurately take up the sentence, you know, my husband has just passed away and I need to, you know, cancel my holiday. The computer doesn't want to write back and say like, we have canceled your holiday and here is a 25% discount. You know, you want to keep the nuances of human interactions in place. It's important not to fully trust the machines yet. At least it's not that good yet. Um, and that's a quote from online that I find that, that that's quite good around that. Um, and then as a final note, because we've got a little bit of time, uh, we're actually growing the team at Edge Tier. Uh, our plan is to, to grow from a small baby startup into a bigger startup. We've been going three years and are kind of revenue funded. And we're looking for good Python developers, um, not necessarily experts in machine learning, but people who can code Python and build APIs and see it as a plus that we're a small team and that they'll get exposure to a full data science stack and be building around that. Um, so that's it. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention.